So thanks to the development of new chemical methods, we today know the DNA sequences of a large number of different genomes. But to understand life's inner workings, it's not sufficient to merely read these sequences. We also need tools to modify the genetic material in order to understand its function. With the discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9 genetic scissors, uh, researchers have obtained such a powerful tool. And that makes it possible to make precise changes to the DNA in any cell or organism. Scientists can now easily investigate the function of genes in various biological processes. In plant breeding, researchers can give plants specific characteristics, such as withstanding drought in warmer climate. In medicine, genome editing is contributing to new cancer therapies. And the first studies attempting to cure inherited diseases is already underway. The CRISPR-Cas9 uh, genetic scissors have taken us into a new epoch and in many ways are bringing the greatest benefit to humankind. This year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry goes to two scientists, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for the, the development of a method for genome editing. Emmanuel Charpentier uh, was born in 1968 in chivisy sur orge in France. She obtained her PhD uh, in 1995 from Institut Pasteur in Paris. And for part of her career, she worked at Umeå University in Sweden. She is now director of the Max Planck Unit for the Science of Pathogens in Berlin, Germany. Emmanuel Charpentier, I now welcome you onto the stage. We are very much looking forward to hearing your lecture. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome you to my Nobel lecture. It is the greatest uh, honor to be awarded together with Jennifer Darna the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the year 2020 for the development of a method for genome editing. I would like to warmly thank the members of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, the members of the Nobel Committee, and all scientists who have uh, supported our nomination. I wish I will be able to give the lecture live. Unfortunately, it is a recorded lecture, but I hope you will enjoy the recording. I would like to start with explaining you the CRISPR-Cas9 technologies, that is this uh, novel method for uh, genome editing. So over the years, uh, all biologists have been uh, extremely uh, interested in always using uh, genetics to understand the functions of genes. And, and we are always in need of, of precise genetics uh, that uh, allows to recognize sites specifically DNA of genomes of cells and organisms and allows to modify uh, genes and their expression. And this is what the CRISPR-Cas9 technology does. Uh, the particularity of this technology is that it's a, a sophisticated technology, yet uh, very simple, versatile. It works very efficiently. And it is composed of a uh, protein component called Cas9 that is uh, represented on this slide as scissors. This protein Cas9 has uh, the ability to recognize site specifically a certain sequence on, on the DNA, a certain sequence of interest, has the ability to cleave the DNA. And this uh, Cas9 protein is uh, programmed uh, by uh, the help of an RNA uh, component that allows to bring Cas9 to the site of interest. So this is a technology that has uh, largely been adopted by the scientific community and uh, has become very popular since uh, the start of its uh, discovery in 2012. So I would like to actually uh, explain you also why uh, this technology is transformative. So the field of, of genetics started in the, in the 19th century uh, up to the mid 20th century whereby rules for fundamental genetics were established uh, with uh, the DNA that was isolated, the DNA that was shown to be the carrier of information, 
and then the genetic code that was deciphered uh, over the, the last years in the 60s. Uh, the last uh, 50 years have witnessed the large development of, of a number of, of technologies, actually all originating from research done on bacteria and, and viruses. And this started in the 70s with uh, different types of enzymes and technologies that would allow to recombine DNA, to clone DNA, to sequence DNA, amplify DNA, target uh, genes and their expression. Uh, the zinc finger and talent nucleases uh, that were discovered uh, over the last uh, 20 years, allowing uh, precise genetics, the same that what CRISPR-Cas9 does, except that CRISPR-Cas9 brings a level of programmability and a level of, of simplicity and versatility that is quite unique. So we are all very happy because we can now uh, study cells and organisms that were difficult to study prior to CRISPR-Cas9. The research on CRISPR-Cas9 originates in, in my lab from our interest in understanding how Streptococcus pyogenes causes uh, diseases in humans. So Streptococcus pyogenes belongs to the class of gram-positive bacteria, such as Listeria and Staphylococci. Uh, these bacteria have been the main focus of my research uh, during my career. Uh, I have always been interested in understanding how bacteria interact with their environment, so in principle the human host, how they can cause diseases, how they can adapt to their environment, survive in the human host, and also to a certain extent how the human host can defend itself against bacterial infections. So the focus was always on regulatory mechanisms that use proteins and small RNAs. The family of small RNAs, it's an interesting uh, family of, of uh, regulatory elements, which we started to work on at the beginning of 2000, so uh, about uh, 20 years ago. And this research always uh, was um, mixed with always a, a need to develop uh, gene technologies along the way, uh, just to be able to study better those mechanisms in bacteria, specifically in the context of their interactions with the human host. And during my, my years as a PhD and postdoc, I was certainly handicapped by uh, the, the, the non-possibility to perform genetics in human cells, which uh, is really the, the, are the hosts for these uh, strict human um, pathogens. So I have developed genetic tools in bacteria. I have also worked on transgenic mice, coming back to uh, understanding the interaction between bacteria and the human host and understanding as well that there was a, a lack of tools that would allow to perform precise genetics in, in human cells, for example. And this, this is what CRISPR-Cas9 can, can do. Uh, the, the field of, of small RNAs uh, has largely evolved the last uh, 30 years. And this was a discovery that RNA molecules, in addition to be messenger RNA or transfer RNA or ribosomal RNAs and being involved in, in the transcription of the DNA into, and translation into uh, proteins, that uh, RNAs had also regulatory functions and would uh, be able to interact with messenger RNA molecules and also with proteins and regulate the expression of genes. Uh, what was not identified at uh, the, let's say about 10, 15 years ago, these were small RNAs that would have the ability to, to uh, change gene expression by interacting directly uh, with DNA. Uh, we were uh, working on some small regulatory RNAs. Uh, we uh, published uh, some data showing that some of these small regulatory RNAs had the ability to change the expression of virulence factors in bacteria, so contributed a lot to the adaptation of bacteria to their environment. And we decided in uh, about 15 years ago to start uh, a search for additional regulatory RNAs. We found a number of those RNAs and we particularly picked an RNA and that is uh, known as tracer RNA because this RNA was very well uh, expressed in, uh, in bacterial cells and you can see the gel that is a northern blot analysis showing the, the expression of these RNAs as different forms in, uh, in uh, Streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, we had found a, a target for this uh, small regulatory RNA. So initially we thought that it would have a role in regulating the expression of the virulence factor. Uh, we had difficulties to make sense of this interaction 
But what was clear is that at least this RNA was encoded in the vicinity of a gene that was annotated to be a gene encoding uh, a protein that is, uh, was CRISPR-related uh, protein containing two nuclease domains. So a CRISPR protein that would have the ability to cleave nucleic acids. So this was a start of none of the less continuing our research on tracer RNA, but also working on CRISPR. So CRISPR uh, is to be uh, seen and, and considered as part of, of defense systems which bacteria and archaea have evolved uh, over millions of years. So bacteria and archaea can be infected by viruses as we can be infected by viruses and bacteria and have evolved uh, diverse uh, immune systems that allow them to cope with the invasion of uh, genetic elements such as viral elements, but also other elements such as plasmids and, and transposons. And this really uh, actually is important and to be seen in the context of, of the fitness of the bacteria with their environment and the evolution of, of the macroorganisms. So here on this slide, you can see a phage that is infecting a bacterial cell uh, with uh, the genomic component of, uh, of the phage that is injected into the bacterial cell, the genomes of, of the virus that can replicate, and then you have the formation of viral particles uh, that can uh, lyse bacterial cells and propagate to lyse further bacterial cells. So here we deal with phages, viruses, that can kill bacterial cells. And surely uh, the, the, the need for bacteria to have evolved systems that allow to uh, to defend themselves uh, against uh, death. So what is interesting is that some of these uh, immune systems uh, have been developed over the years as uh, genetic tools. So for example, restriction enzymes are originally uh, actually defense systems existing in, in bacteria. Uh, CRISPR is, is unique in the sense that it is an adaptive immune system. There is a first step of, of recognition that uh, leads to the, to the immunity. And it is composed of uh, protein components, the Cas proteins, and RNA components, the CRISPR RNA. So I do not have uh, the time to go very deeply uh, into the history of, of the CRISPR-Cas uh, research. However, I would like to mention that uh, this has involved a number of scientists who have really performed a pioneer work on CRISPR-Cas. I have read all the, the publications on CRISPR-Cas when we started to work on, on the CRISPR-Cas9 system in my lab. And this, has, this is really by reading all those articles that, uh, that it uh, allowed me to, to really understand what would be different of the CRISPR-Cas9 system compared to other CRISPR-Cas systems that were uh, studied by my colleagues. But in brief, uh, the, the CRISPR uh, components are uh, such that uh, the first identification were the repeats of the CRISPR array. So uh, the CRISPR array is formed by um, very short sequences that are identical to one another, uh, that forms repeats, and that are interspaced by uh, sequences that uh, have uh, as origin mobile genetic elements. This CRISPR array uh, was shown to be able to be transcribed into RNA molecules of different sizes, so probably maturation events taking place to activate those uh, CRISPR RNA molecules. In the vicinity of the CRISPR array, you have the CRISPR-associated genes that encode the CRISPR-associated proteins. And, and very fast as well, there was uh, the observation that these CRISPR-associated proteins contain domains uh, that are homologous to domains contained in, in proteins that have the ability to target DNA, target RNA, and also cleave DNA and cleave RNA. So altogether, the idea was that uh, these CRISPR-Cas systems would be ob obviously adaptive immune systems in bacteria and archaea. That was shown experimentally later on in Streptococcus thermophilus, but that also uh, those, uh, those uh, systems were uh, identified as prokaryotic uh, RNA interferon systems uh, by analogy to RNA interferon systems. So when we started uh, the research, uh, the dogma was that uh, there would be a, 
a, crisp, a complex of CRISPR-associated proteins that will be formed and that will associate to the CRISPR RNA to act as a machinery that would allow to target the DNA or the RNA. So the way it works is as follows. The system is adaptive in the sense that the bacteria have first to recognize uh, the virus and will have the ability to memorize the infection by the virus. And this is the way it is done. So the virus will inject its, uh, its DNA into the bacterial cell. The CRISPR-Cas system will be able to recognize uh, the invading DNA, uh, uh, cleave uh, a certain sequence of, of the invading DNA and insert this sequence into the CRISPR array. And this is working as a kind of memorization of the virus. And then you will have uh, expression uh, at the RNA level of uh, these uh, memorized uh, elements of viral infections. Uh, the CRISPR RNAs will associate with a complex of CRISPR associated uh, proteins. And uh, those RNAs allowing to guide the CRISPR associated proteins to the, the invading uh, DNA of the virus upon a second infection. And this is the way it works. And there will be recognition of the virus and one protein of the CRISPR-Cas system uh, will uh, ultimately uh, cleave uh, the invading DNA and the DNA cannot replicate. And this is a dead end for, for the virus. So this is uh, globally uh, how it works. Um, in Streptococcus pyogenes, we were lucky enough to uh, have on, on, on the genome of Streptococcus pyogenes uh, genes that uh, were belonging to a certain type of CRISPR-Cas system that was not studied yet, at least at the molecular level. Uh, what uh, the, the groups of, of, uh, of Orvarts, Barangu, and Moineau had shown is that the CRISPR-Cas9 system was really uh, in Streptococcus thermophilus uh, implying, uh, uh, involving one uh, CRISPR-associated uh, protein, Cas9, that will be involved in, uh, in the recognition of the virus upon second infection. But the molecular mechanism uh, was not described. And this is what we started in, in our lab. So uh, we um, decided to look at uh, the, the question whether tracer RNA would actually have a regulatory role on the CRISPR-Cas system. And this is what we found. What we found is that tracer RNA contains uh, an anti-repeat sequence that allows it to base pair uh, with uh, the repeats of the CRISPR RNAs. And this duplex of RNA is actually uh, stabilized by the protein Cas9. Uh, then following uh, this, uh, this um, it's going to be maturated by uh, enzymes in the, in the bacteria, specifically uh, the, the RNAs3, and further our RNAs uh, that will lead to the mature form of the duplex of RNA still bound to the protein Cas9. Uh, then this uh, complex of uh, Cas9, uh, guided by uh, the duplex of RNA, will be able to recognize that specifically the DNA and uh, cleave the DNA using two nuclease domains and cleave the DNA in a, in a sequence specific manner. So this is what we have shown, uh, seeing right away that the system from Streptococcus pyogenes was working very efficiently uh, with uh, cleavages that were uh, as those uh, we were uh, expecting. Um, now with regard to the programmability of, of, uh, of the system, the idea was to simplify this duplex of RNA and uh, fuse those two RNAs to have a single guide RNA that will be the programmable element of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So bringing simplicity for the design of the technology. Um, one thing that is important to mention is that uh, the, the mechanism is very sophisticated in the sense that uh, the ability to use two nucleus domains to cleave the DNA and this programmability allowed to develop uh, the Cas9 technology further into a technology that can really perform multiple modifications on, on the genome. Uh, so it can uh, correct uh, mutations, introduce new mutations on the DNA. It can allow to delete genes, delete certain sequences of DNA, add new sequences of DNA at the site of interest, replace genes by other genes. And over the last eight years, a number of scientists and developers have really uh, put forward the, the technology uh, to really um, have the technology 
evolving in multiple versions that allow to do some multiplexing and uh, that um, really uh, allow to perform precise genetics in an unprecedented manner. Very fast, actually. Scientists uh, adopted this, uh, this uh, technology and showed in a very, very short uh, amount of time that the technology was efficient to act on, on the DNA and uh, modify genes and their expression in a variety of cells, including human cells, in organoids, in model organisms such as mice, fish, uh, fly, and also uh, plants. So a very transformative uh, technology. Uh, I do not have for sure the time to explain you all the details of the science behind, behind the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system, but CRISPR-Cas is a largely uh, evolving system, uh, all the CRISPR-Cas systems, including CRISPR-Cas9. And this is early on the diversity of, of this system that we understood what will be conserved and what will be the basis of the mechanism. So really this Cas9 protein guided by a duplex of RNA, and that could be uh, among all the different CRISPR-Cas systems existing, that will be the system minimal enough to harness as a powerful gene technology. And um, this is quite amazing how the, the systems uh, have evolved. They have evolved surely in multiple other systems than the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Now we have uh, two classes uh, identified, and within each of the class, multiple systems and subsystems. So since CRISPR-Cas9, other minimal systems have been uh, identified, further developed also as CRISPR-Cas uh, technology, so enlarging the CRISPR-Cas toolbox. You have large applications uh, for this genome editing uh, technology, so for sure for, uh, to understand better mechanisms of, of life, so it's very useful for fundamental research, uh, to unravel novel molecules, novel pathways, to be able to really work with uh, the, the cells and the organisms that are of interest for clinical purposes. The technology has been also uh, very well uh, developed with regard to um, the applications in understanding better th uh, the mechanisms of, of life sciences in model organisms, such as mice, drosophila, and, and fish. Uh, it has also been a game changer for allowing precise genetics in plants, and it has uh, large applications in medicine, either directly or indirectly, uh, by uh, allowing to develop better models of, of diseases, and also by allowing to develop the CRISPR-Cas9 technology as a direct tool uh, for uh, um, really uh, to, to work as a, as a gene medicine and uh, use the technology directly uh, to treat certain types of, of diseases, such as uh, human genetic disorders, or uh, certain cancers by combining um, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology uh, with uh, immunotherapy. Uh, it's also uh, very transformative in the field of plant biology with the production of, of plant crops, surely with ethical considerations that have to be taken into account. Uh, what next? So surely the CRISPR biologists continue to, to work on this field, continue to identify novel CRISPR-Cas systems, uh, thanks to the sequencing of novel genomes of, of bacterial species and archaeal species. Um, recently, novel defense systems in bacteria and archaea have been uh, identified, and, and this will continue. So. We can expect from research on, on microbes uh, to have uh, further genetic technologies to be uh, identified in the, in the future. It is an, an exciting research for young scientists because now the, the young scientists have, have a really powerful tool to study their cells and organisms of interest and, and do genetics in a way that was not possible 20, 25 years ago. Uh, what is very also interesting with uh, the, the timeline of all those technologies is that the, the impact of CRISPR-Cas makes uh, um, even more sense with regard to all the technologies that have developed over the last 15, 20 years, such as 
high throughput technologies to sequence uh, genomes, uh, high throughput technologies for screening, uh, for screening, all the, the technologies of uh, imaging and, and all the technologies that have largely evolved delivering uh, technologies to deliver um, uh, gene technologies such as CRISPR-Cas9 in cells and organisms, and also new technologies that allow to culture cells and organisms that were not possible to culture 15, 20 years ago. So this makes uh, a global sense, and that's why I think it's really an, an exciting time to be able to study the evolution and the diversity of the world. Um, another message that I would like to, to provide as well is that, as a matter of fact, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 originates from research done on bacteria and viruses. And we do know in our days how uh, important it is to really maintain the research uh, in microbiology, to maintain the expertise and to study more bacteria and viruses, not only because they can cause diseases and, and, uh, and we need to find new treatments uh, for those uh, infectious diseases, but also because the last 50 years have shown to which extent bacteria and viruses are, are really a valuable source for the development of novel uh, biotechnologies. I would like to thank surely the people who have done the work. Uh, this work would not have been possible without uh, young scientists uh, being extremely committed and extremely enthusiastic. Uh, the work from my side started uh, in Vienna at the Max Birds Labs at the University of Vienna. The main part was done when I was a principal investigator at the Laboratory for Molecular Infection Medicine Sweden at Umeå University. I would like to thank a number of people, but I would like to mention Maria Eckert, who was uh, a, a postdoc in my lab in Vienna identifying uh, tracer RNA. Christoph Shilinski and Elitsa Delcheva, who have been key uh, students uh, driving the project forward. I would like to thank my collaborators, Eugenie Kunin, Kira Makarova, Cynthia Sharma, Jörg Vogel, Martin Inek, and surely Jennifer Dorna, my co-laureate. Uh, this was a great time. Uh, this research uh, developed within five years of time, at least from my lab, and I really enjoy this exciting time working with uh, wonderful collaborators. I would like also to take the opportunity to thank all my former and lab members who have worked with me the last uh, 18 years in Austria, Sweden, and, and Germany. It has always been a pleasure to work with young scientists, and this is also the, the reason why I like to do uh, science. And last but not least, I would like to thank my family, my friends, Rodger Novak, and all my colleagues who have supported <laughs> my work and who have helped me uh, during my career. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Jennifer Dauna was born in 1964 in Washington, D.C. In 1989, she received her PhD from Harvard Medical School in Boston. She currently serves as a professor at the University of California, Berkeley uh, in the US. Jennifer Dauna, I now welcome you onto the stage. We are very much looking forward to hearing your lecture. I'd like to begin by thanking the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, the Nobel Prize Committee in Chemistry, my family, including my spouse, Jamie Kate, our son, Andy, my sisters, Ellen and Sarah Doudna, my friends, colleagues, and of course, my former and current lab members about whose research I will be speaking today. It's a wonderful honor to have this opportunity to share with you the science that we've done over the last few years and to discuss the extraordinary opportunities and exciting advances that are happening right now with CRISPR-Cas9 as a genome editing technology. I thought I would begin by telling you about the origin of the ideas around CRISPR. And this began at least two decades ago with research in microbiology laboratories showing that bacteria might have an adaptive immune system, a way to provide protection against viral infection that would allow cells to acquire it in real time and then protect the cells from those viruses 
using this recording system in the genome. And this system came to be called CRISPR. And as I'm showing here, this is a mechanism by which bacteria and archaeal cells can adapt to viruses by integrating small pieces of viral DNA into the organism genome at a site called CRISPR, and then using that information to make an RNA copy of the sequence that can then provide the information required for detection and cleavage of viral DNA or sometimes viral RNA using CRISPR-associated or Cas proteins. And this slide shows the way this system is thought to act in bacteria and represents experiments that were done in the field early on, both using bioinformatics and molecular genetics to understand the function of this pathway. This video shows the way that we imagine CRISPR operates in nature, where bacteria that might be growing in a biofilm are being infected by viruses, and when the virus injects its DNA into the cell, the cell can acquire a small piece of that foreign DNA into the CRISPR locus, a place in the genome that consists of repeated sequences that flank these integrated sequences from viruses that are called spacers. And the cell then makes a copy of that integrated sequence in the form of RNA, which is then processed into individual units that include a sequence derived from a virus. Those RNAs combine with tr a second type of RNA called tracer and a protein called Cas9 to form a surveillance complex, an RNA-guided protein that can search the cell looking for sequences that match the sequence of the guide RNA. And when a match occurs, the CRISPR-Cas protein, Cas9, is able to cut double-stranded DNA, triggering destruction of the DNA in a bacterial cell. And this pathway has been operating for a long time, over evolutionary time, evolving in bacteria, and has, over time, been diversified into many different uh, forms of CRISPR systems that can operate effectively in these organisms. Um, but today, I'm actually going to talk about, in particular, about one type of CRISPR-Cas system that uses the protein Cas9, as I showed in that uh, example. This slide shows the three steps in CRISPR-acquired immunity that include adaptation, expression, and interference. And in the research that I did in my laboratory with a number of my former students, beginning with Blake Wiedenheft and then Rachel Horowitz and, and folks that came after them, we began investigating, in particular, this third step in the pathway called interference, the stage of the CRISPR pathway that involves an RNA-guided detection of viral DNA. Back in 2011, we had the good fortune to begin a collaboration with Emmanuelle Charpentier and her student Christoph Chylinski. And this launched a wonderful opportunity to answer what was at the time a very interesting and intriguing question in the CRISPR field, namely, what is the function of the protein called CRISPR-Cas9? And we were fascinated by this question because this particular protein had been implicated in protection of cells, um, and in particular, a type of bacteria that Emmanuel's group was studying called Streptococcus pyogenes, an organism that infects human beings. And um, this particular organism has a CRISPR-Cas9 protein encoded in its CRISPR system that was implicated in protection of cells from viral infection. But the question was how? And so in our collaboration, we investigated uh, this and addressed the question by doing biochemical experiments that involved working with purified CRISPR-Cas9 protein and the RNA that guides it to target DNA sequences in cells. And what we found, and this is research done by Martin Yinek, a former postdoc in my laboratory, and Chris Chylinski working in Emmanuel's laboratory, is that CRISPR-Cas9 in nature is a dual RNA-guided protein. As I showed in that introductory video, this is a protein 
that uses a CRISPR RNA molecule to direct it to a sequence of DNA that matches the CRISPR RNA sequence. And it also requires a second RNA molecule called tracer that provides the, an interaction with the CRISPR RNA required for assembly with Cas9. And so together, these two RNAs guide Cas9 to DNA sequences where the protein Cas9 is able to make a cut in the double helix uh, of DNA. I think one of the wonderful aspects of CRISPR and this project with Emmanuel's group is that this was the point in our research where what began as a curiosity-driven investigation morphed into a project that had much broader implications because once we understood how nature uses du a dual RNA system to guide Cas9 to target DNA sequences, it was possible to engineer the dual RNA guide as a single guide RNA shown here that included both the targeting information and the structural requirement for assembly with the Cas9 protein in a single RNA molecule. And once this experiment was done by Martin and by Kristoff, we found that Cas9 could be programmed with single guide RNAs and directed to cleave double-stranded DNA at a desired sequence, taking advantage both of the actual targeting information in the CRISPR RNA molecule, as well as the requirement for what's called a PAM sequence, a protospacer adjacent motif, PAM is easier, that occurs right next to the target sequence in the DNA. And those two elements are required for Cas9 to recognize and cleave DNA um, but this, this, uh, this requirement is sufficient for Cas9 to function as a, uh, an RNA-guided DNA cleaver. And I wanted to show you a key experiment that Martin Yinek did to test this idea of a single-guided Cas9 protein that could cleave different sequences of DNA. And the experiment was to design guide RNAs that would recognize several different sequences in a plasmid DNA, a circular piece of double-stranded DNA that we could purify in the laboratory. And what you're seeing on the slide here are marked in red five different sites in this plasmid DNA that were chosen as target sequences for single guide RNAs that we produced in the laboratory. And Martin did the experiment of taking those single guide RNAs, adding them to the purified Cas9 protein, and then incubating together with the plasmid DNA molecule in a laboratory test tube. And then to analyze the result of that, that experiment, he separated the cleaved DNA products, an agarose gel system, which is shown here, which is simply a way of separating DNA of different sizes from uh, from each other. And what you can see in each lane of this gel system is that depending on where the guide RNA was directed to, uh, to interact with the plasmid DNA, Cas9 would generate a cut, and then by also cutting the plasmid at a separate place so that two double-stranded breaks were introduced into the plasmid at one time, we could release these little fragments of DNA that I hope you can see on this gel system that migrate at different positions, representing different sizes of these DNA fragments. And I have to say that um, on the day that Martin Yinek did this experiment and got this result, we were just incredibly excited. It was the pure joy of discovery at recognizing that we not only understood how this bacterial enzyme Cas9 functions, but we had actually figured out how to engineer it as a simple two-component system for directing DNA double-stranded cutting. Now, why was that so exciting? Well, it was, of course, interesting to know that we could, um, we could harness our knowledge in this way and engineer the protein to, to have this desired cleavage capability. But in addition, it also allowed us to imagine how CRISPR-Cas9 could actually be harnessed as a technology for something quite different in eukaryotic cells, namely cells like plant, animal, human cells, all of which 
treat double strand breaks in DNA differently than the way they are treated in bacteria. And I'll show that on the next couple of slides. So in eukaryotic cells, when the cell receives or detects a double-stranded break to the genome, to the DNA in the cell, the break is detected and repaired, typically before it can cause cell death. And the repair pathways involve either a non-homologous end-joining event shown on the left side of this slide that can sometimes introduce a small disruption to the DNA sequence, or there can be an integration of DNA that has homology to the sequence of DNA flanking the double-stranded break. And in that case, a new piece of genetic information is incorporated into the genome at the site of the original break. This was research that had been done over the previous couple of decades before Emmanuel and I did our work with Cas9. But we recognized that the activity of Cas9, its ability to introduce a double-stranded break to DNA at a desired position by directing it with these single-guide RNAs, could allow scientists to introduce double-stranded breaks into a genome that could trigger the kind of repair that I'm showing here. And so we imagined a system working very much like in this video where the Cas9 protein could be directed to enter the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell and with its guide RNA, search the genome for a 20 base pair sequence that would match the 20 nucleotides, the 20 letters of the guide RNA that would provide a match. And when that match occurs, we now understand that Cas9 is able to unwind the DNA. It allows the Cas9 protein to generate a precise double-stranded break in the DNA by cleaving each strand of DNA. And then those broken ends are handed off to repair enzymes in eukaryotic cells that lead to DNA repair. And in the process of, of repairing the DNA, there is the ability to introduce a change to the genome at a precise place, which is really the definition of genome engineering. So, on the next few slides, I want to sh share a few things that we've learned over the last few years about how Cas9 is able to achieve this kind of, of editing in genomes of cells by triggering double-stranded breaks. And I'll start with showing a molecular model of the Cas9 protein, and this is based on a crystallographic structure that was solved originally by several different laboratories, uh, our own, the lab of Martin Yinek, the lab of Osamu Nureki, and subsequently many others who have contributed to understanding the actual molecular basis for Cas9's function. And in this slide, what you can see is the white protein, uh, Cas9, holding on to its orange guide RNA and a blue double helical DNA molecule. And I'd like to point out that in this structure, we can see the mechanism by which Cas9 uses an RNA guide to interact with DNA at a precise position, because you can see the orange and blue helix formed inside the Cas9 protein, representing the interaction between the guide RNA and one strand of the target DNA molecule. This is the actual way that these proteins are able to find and hold on to DNA prior to DNA cleavage. The next thing that we learned in the lab in studying how this cleavage event actually works is that a series of experiments showed that Cas9 is a highly dynamic protein. It has to be to be able to handle DNA, unwind a double helix the way we know it does, it has to be able to move. And through a series of, of chemical experiments that allowed us to detect motions in different parts of the protein, we discovered that Cas9 has, undergoes a large conformational change as it holds on to DNA and catalyzes cutting. And I'll show that in this uh, video here. So this shows the Cas9 protein alone morphing to the structure it forms when it binds to the guide RNA, which you can see now in orange. This is the, the structure that is able to search the cell looking for a matching sequence of DNA. And when that match occurs, there's an additional structural change in the protein that accommodates the DNA molecule so that you can now see 
the RNA DNA helix forming inside of Cas9. And then finally, this yellow part of Cas9 swings into position so that it can cleave the DNA strand that is attached to the guide RNA. And this is a, a very important aspect of the, the chemistry of Cas9 catalyzed DNA cutting because it provides a, a mechanism for sensing the interaction between the guide RNA and the DNA and ensuring accuracy of Cas9's cutting mechanism. In uh, work that was done just over the last few years, Fugo Zhang, a, a former postdoc in my laboratory and, and very sadly now deceased, did a series of very exciting structural experiments to reveal the shape of the Cas9 protein when it's engaged on a full-length uh, DNA molecule. This shows, again, the guide RNA in orange. The DNA strands are in blue and magenta. And you can see how the DNA is held open by the Cas9 protein and allowed to interact with the cleavage sites in the enzyme for precise double-stranded cutting of both strands of the DNA. And then in this image, you can see in green the, um, one of the cutting parts of the enzyme swinging into position so that it can actually catalyze the chemistry required for DNA strand break. And then uh, I wanted to also point out that in addition to these conformational changes that happen in the Cas9 protein itself, we also now understand that this protein is quite dynamic in the way that it interacts with long pieces of DNA, for example, uh, chromosomes in cells. It has to be able to move very quickly along the length of DNA searching for a sequence that will bear a complementary match to the guide RNA. How does that work? It seemed like an extraordinary uh, capability to us initially. And so in experiments that we did in the laboratory over several years with a number of former lab members and, and collaborators, we came up with the model shown here that I think is consistent with current data suggesting that the Cas9 protein has the ability to bind and release DNA very quickly, and that allows it to search through very large, very you know, really vast uh, stretches of DNA quite fast to allow it, uh, interrogation of the, the sequence that's being searched for a match with the guide RNA. And so in this example, the guide RNA is in red, and you can see that our data suggest that when this Cas9 protein with its guide interacts with DNA, it begins to pry apart the two strands of the double helix to allow the protein to ask, is there a complementarity for binding to the CRISPR RNA? And if there is, then our data suggests that the strands of the DNA continue to melt apart that allows the RNA DNA helix to form inside the Cas9 protein. And if that helix is perfect or close to perfect, then the enzyme is triggered to cleave DNA. And this is quite a, an amazing mechanism and clearly allows bacteria to search the cell very quickly, looking for viral DNAs to destroy. But in eukaryotic cells, this mechanism is equally effective at triggering double-stranded breaks that can be repaired and trigger uh, changes um, in the format of, of genome editing that we now understand can be effectively uh, catalyzed by Cas9. So in the next part of the talk, I really want to turn my attention to where this technology is going. And there's a, a lot to, that one could say here, so I'm really going to hit on a few of the highlights. And first of all is the fact that Genome editing extends across all of biology. It can be used for fundamental research, but also for exciting applications in public health, in agriculture, and in biomedicine. And it's very important also, I think, to point out that genome editing can be conducted in many different kinds of cells and fundamentally in the two kinds of cells that I'm pointing out here. One category of cell is a somatic cell. That's a cell that is fully differentiated. It does not have the ability to uh, create a new organism. 
versus a germ cell, which is a cell such as a sperm or an egg cell or cells in an early embryo that have uh, pluripotency and they're able to di differentiate into many different cell types as an organism is forming. If, if genome edits are, create, are introduced in a somatic cell, those changes to DNA are not heritable, so they affect only one cell or one tissue type or one, one individual organism. But if genome edits are introduced into a germ cell, they have the potential to uh, be heritable and to introduce changes that become part of not only an individual, but all of that individual's progeny. And this is, of course, very powerful when we think about using it in plants or using it to create better animal models of human disease, for example, as has been done using CRISPR-Cas9 in mice and rats. It's very different when we think about how it could be impactful in, uh, in human biology and the, of course, enormous um, ethical and societal issues that are raised by the possibility of using germline editing in humans. And I won't say too much more about that, but there's a, it's been a, become a very active area of my own work over the last few years is to think about responsible use of CRISPR-Cas9 and in particular its use in humans and ensuring that there's transparency and careful thought that goes into work, uh, particularly when applied in the human germline. But in somatic cell editing, I think there are extraordinary and exciting opportunities that we will, will be uh, developed in the near future. And one of them is in the area of correction to disease-causing mutations in humans. And this is just one of many examples, the opportunity to correct a mutation well-defined that causes sickle cell anemia and can now be corrected using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And this is no longer a potential opportunity, but it's actually been realized by using CRISPR-Cas9 to correct the, the um, disease-causing mutation in a patient and to show that this technology is safe and effective for this kind of treatment of genetic disease. I think this is a, a very exciting way to uh, imagine how this technology will impact human health in the future. And of course, with germline editing, one has to think about how this technology will advance in the future. And I, I certainly imagine that uh, we will see in increasing applications in germ cells, including in the human germ line. And of course, that has to be managed very carefully. And I'm uh, pleased that there's been a, an active international effort to control the use of CRISPR-Cas9 and certainly to encourage transparency, especially with the recent release of a report that discusses the science and the technology around human germline editing and very importantly establishes criteria for using CRISPR-Cas9 in the human germline in the future. In the last few minutes, I'd like to turn to where CRISPR technology is headed in the future. And one of the aspects that, uh, of this work that's fascinating is the incredible diversity of CRISPR systems in nature. This continues to drive the field in terms of fundamental biology, understanding what these systems do in their natural settings and microbes, and of course, how they may be harnessed as uh, technologies in other organisms, as was the case for CRISPR-Cas9. I wanted to mention briefly the effort to investigate new CRISPR-Cas systems, and one of the recent uh, findings that we've had with our collaborator Jillian Banfield at Berkeley is the discovery that phage, bacteriophage, the viruses that um, bacteria use CRISPR to, to protect against, in fact, can also carry around their own CRISPR-Cas systems. And this is one example shown here, a protein that we, we named CRISPR-Cas5 that is entirely phage encoded. It's a tiny protein but it nonetheless has the RNA-guided DNA cutting capabilities that we discovered originally in CRISPR-Cas9. And so this is, a, I think, a fascinating example of nature's diversity as well as the opportunities that this protein might provide for future applications, including um, in cases where one could benefit from having a very tiny protein, a small gene that encodes that protein, 
that could be potentially more easily delivered into eukaryotic cells. We've also been very interested in other biochemical activities of CRISPR-Cas proteins. And I'll mention here very briefly that in research done originally by Alexandra East Seletsky, a former graduate student in my laboratory, and Mitch O'Connell working in partnership with her, they discovered that a class of CRISPR proteins called Cas13, which are naturally RNA-targeting enzymes, have a biochemical activity that could be harnessed as a, a detection mechanism. And this was an experiment done originally by Alexandra E. Selesky and actually suggested by Jamie Kate, the idea of putting fluorophores onto small pieces of RNA that were cleaved upon Cas13's detection of an RNA sequence using its RNA guide. And this system turned out to be highly effective at detection of RNA molecules all the way down to about uh, picomolar levels. This was in just very early experiments with an off-the-shelf kit called RNAse Alert in the laboratory. But it also triggered our interest in the biochemical activities of other families of CRISPR-Cas proteins. And in research done a couple of years ago, Janice Chen, a student in my lab at the time, showed that another family of enzymes called Cas12 also have the ability to cleave single-stranded molecules, in this case, single-stranded DNA, upon recognition of a double-stranded DNA target. And in this experiment, what Janice Chen showed is that the Cas12 protein, upon recognition of a double-stranded DNA, is able to cleave single-stranded um, molecules of DNA, shown in this experiment in the panel in the center of the slide, showing very rapid degradation of a circular single-stranded DNA molecule in this experiment, which is an activity, a biochemical activity, that we do not detect for Cas9. And working with a colleague, Joel Polevsky, at University of California, San Francisco, we were able to use this Cas12 activity for detection of the uh, human papillomavirus in human patient samples and even to distinguish between two different strains of the human papillomavirus, which is what's shown in the uh, panel in the center of the slide. And so this told us that not only could CRISPR-Cas enzymes be useful for detection, but they could also be useful for specificity in figuring out what type of viral signal might be present in a patient sample. And of course, in the current uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic that has become a worldwide human health issue, we and, and others have been using this type of CRISPR-Cas detection to identify samples in, in patient uh, saliva or in patient uh, nasal swabs, and to do so very quickly Ultimately, we hope with a readout that will involve a simple mechanism with a cell phone that can record the results of these diagnostic tests and help people everywhere to screen themselves against this virus and importantly, provide a mechanism for future pandemic preparedness because of the programmability of the CRISPR-Cas enzymes, which is a fundamental property of their biology and their ability to be harnessed as technology. So I'd like to, to close by just pointing out that the RNA-guided gene regulation that we observe in CRISPR-Cas systems is fundamental to the way they work in bacteria, but also to the way they operate as technologies for genome editing and beyond. Delivery and control are going to be key in the future, so we need to have better ways to deliver the CRISPR-Cas9 and related proteins into cell types of interest for genome editing, including into human patients. And fundamental research will continue to drive the field forward, as it has in the past and as it will in the future. The possibilities are endless, and I'm excited about what will happen in the future, both with fundamental research and with the applications that will solve real-world problems in human health and the environment. I'd like to thank my past and current lab members with whom I've had the joy of doing science together over many years. I want to thank the many colleagues who have been involved in the fields of genome engineering, in DNA repair, 
and in the applications of genome editing that have made the field so exciting over the last few years. And finally, I want to thank my colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, who I've had the joy of working with and where we share together the dedication to public education and research that makes our work so rewarding. Thank you very much.